introduce now our next speaker is Professor Dirk Helbing from the ETH Zürich. Dirk Helbing is a professor of computational social, social science at the Department of Humanities, Social and Political Science, an affiliate of the Computer Science Department in Zurich. Recently, he's also involved in the area of citizen science, the activities of state labor in Swiss, as well as the establishment of a blockchain initiative and the blockchain lab in Delft. Lastly, he's also a member of Federal Academy of Science committees addressing the digital transformation of our society. I know for a fact that he's also very much into the intersection between democracy and digitization. And I'm incredibly happy to now introduce to you, uh, Mr. Helbing, and I'm looking forward to his talk. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you and to talk about upgrading democracy and capitalism using digital technology. We all know the problems of the world are complex and uh, one of our main problems is actually the lack of sustainability. We're simply overusing renewable resources and that's not going to end well if you're not going to find more sustainable solutions and that's why we have this UN Agenda 2030, among many other things. But the question is how to go about it, really. And we are basically speaking up for a new paradigm to go from manipulation and control to empowerment and coordination. And the inspiration is swarm intelligence. <laughs> We are finding this uh, socially intelligent behavior in many areas of uh, our nature and society. Uh, back in 1714, this book, The Fable of the Bees, was written and the proposal was basically to transfer the organization of uh, beehives uh, to our society. Now, it, it's important to know that the queen bee doesn't command the other bees, but uh, it's based on self-organization, largely um, using simple mechanisms to explore the environment and to come up with um, efficient solutions collectively. And one can basically break this down into three phases, which are important. Phase one, requires independent exploration. So people or animals should not be manipulated in this stage. Uh, also diversity is very important. Phase two then uh, comes with information exchange. Only then is uh, mutual influence possible. And phase three is the integration of information of uh, solution proposals and that creates the collective intelligence, it means uh, solutions that are typically better than individual solutions. And that is something that is also found in crowds. We call this the wisdom of crowds, but we also know it can go wrong if uh, there is lack of diversity or if people are being manipulated in their information search. But yes, diversity can promote social intelligence. And the question is really, how can we make use of this trick to the benefit of society? In other words, how can we bring the best ideas of many minds together? And as I said before, it's really diversity that matters. Uh, it's important to have different views, different perspectives on a complex problem and to, to come up with various solutions and then try to combine or integrate them uh, in an innovative way. And this is usually going to produce better solutions than any individual uh, would come up with, including experts. And so it's really a collective effect that produces this extra benefit. Of course, it could be several integrated innovative solutions and therefore in human societies we typically also have a force phase which is voting we often use majority voting however that doesn't have to be the case because there are also many other voting rules and some of our research is related to, to the question 
what voting rules should we use in what kind of context, what are the benefits or what are the downsides? And uh, there are actually voting rules that seem to be much better than majority voting. Okay, so all this uh, knowledge can be used basically to upgrade democracy, to build digital democracy, as we call it. So from my point of view, it's, it's not about EIDs and e-voting, it's really about enabling and unleashing collective intelligence. And one framework in which this can be done particularly well is what we call City Olympics, which is basically a competition between cities where there would be different disciplines like reducing energy consumption or uh, reducing climate impact or improving sustainability or increasing resilience. And in all those different disciplines, there would be competitions among the cities. In each city, all the stakeholders would be involved, like uh, politics, the media, companies, uh, science, uh, citizen scientists, and also the civil society. And um, each city would try to make progress. And then there would be a ranking of best of solutions, basically. And those solutions then in a second cooperative phase would be open sourced uh, would be creative commons and so every city could pick those solutions that fit their needs best companies and civil science uh, initiatives uh, civil society initiatives could take those solutions and combine them with each other develop them further and so on so we would really benefit from intelligent solutions all over the world so that's really how to build collective intelligence and benefit from this and that brings us to a new way of globalization which we call localization which is about thinking global but acting local and diverse to make experiments and learn from each other and help each other and in fact, uh, we've done that on a, a very small scale uh, to demonstrate the principles and ideas. So we call that the Climate City Cup. And uh, there were a number of different disciplines, uh, also uh, mobility related, for example, biking to work or um, compensating miles for those who were using cars or flying around or also when buying products and so on. But we didn't leave it there. We were also developing our own devices, for example, air quality sensors. And um, this could, of course, be taken around by people in order to measure the air quality in their city and uh, provide maps with recommendations uh, how to choose routes from A to B in a way that would be healthier. And uh, this is exactly the approach that we've been taking and we want actually to take ahead also in the future. And I hope uh, that this idea is, is going to spread and people will get excited about it because I think this is really a democratic way of making huge progress around the world in a collective participatory way that respects also human rights and respects nature. Further on, we have been thinking about how to use the Internet of Things in order to make our economy more sustainable. Um, in industry countries, people produce about 50 tons of waste in a lifetime. This includes a lot of valuable resources and it wouldn't have to be this way. So in principle, we should use those resources much better. We should know about the impact of our decisions and actions. The same should apply to companies. And so we should actually build measurement networks collectively as a citizen web, which would measure noise and CO2 and emissions and um, resources that would be thrown away and also good things like health and education and so on could be collectively determined, of course, in a privacy respecting way. And uh, then one could couple that to new kinds of currencies in a multi-dimensional way to uh, produce 
many different kinds of feedback. So we would have a CO2 currency, we would have a noise currency, we would have a currency for any resource that would matter. And in this way, we could infuse new kinds of forces into our economic system that would little by little uh, drive the system towards a circular and sharing economy through co-evolution. And who wants to know a bit more can read this book, which has recently been published. It's, by the way, uh, open access, that means for free. And I'd like to end by saying, I think in the networked world of today, of the success principles of um, in a complex world of the 21st century are co-principles like co-learning, co-creation, coordination, cooperation, and co-evolution. So let's do this together, all right?